All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. Or if you're just joining us for the first time, welcome to the World Accords Virtual Conference on Global Sustainability. Um, it's our second session that we're having this afternoon. Before we start that, I'd like to just uh, take a moment to thank all the people who have helped put this on. So all the organizers and, and Troy Roach, who's looking after uh, helping with all the tech this afternoon, uh, as well as um, our partners in the field and, uh, and our donors and supporters and everyone who's shown up. So thank you very much for, for joining us. The second session this afternoon is really a, about sustainable living and uh, we have some friends and actually uh, Chad is, is more than that. He's, he's the chairman of the board of World Accord uh, and his wife Shannon and they have a wonderful property out by Milton uh, and they are farming on that while well, gardening on it and doing all kinds of wonderful things. And it's not just about what they're doing for themselves to kind of be sustainable out there, but also they're going to share some of the stuff that they're doing for World Accord out there. So uh, anyways, Chad and Shannon have been supporters of World Accord ever since before I started. Um, they've been amazing to have on board and I love them dearly. And uh, I hope that uh, you have an opportunity to learn something from them this afternoon. Uh, don't be afraid to, uh, to ask questions or leave comments in the comment field. If anyone feels inspired to uh, leave a donation, if you check the comments below, you will also see that there's a link in there that you can press to, uh, to make a donation. Or you can always go to worldaccord.org and there's a donate button there as well if, uh, if it's hard to find other, other places to, to make a donation. So without further ado, I would like to pass it on to Chad and Shannon Daly, and I hope everyone has an enjoyable session with them. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Chad. Uh, Shannon's behind the camera, but we'll, uh, we'll flip that around shortly so she can see what's going on. But uh, we want to talk about our some of the things that we do. I guess it makes us more sustainable as a family here, uh, living on, uh, I guess we're about 18 acres of land. We're able to grow a good part of our food, uh, not so much uh, the proteins, but uh, a lot of vegetables and stuff, which keep us going throughout the year. And the biggest part of my focus, because uh, I'm, I'm not really a gardener, I really don't enjoy it that much, but my wife loves it. Uh, I prefer to do the farming side in, uh, with our maple syrup. Uh, so what we've done with that is we're we're working to actually donate uh, the syrup. So we've basically created a small business. And so we're always looking for ideas through World of Court where people can do something, uh, whether that be their own little micro enterprise or social business where they're able to provide maybe a, a percentage of the back. Uh, and I would say that spawned from uh, the idea really came to my head because I had seen, and I can't remember the name of the guy anymore, but there was a, a salad dressing uh, that was made years ago, uh, maybe still, where a percentage of that or maybe all of that, those proceeds went to a charity. Uh, so Shannon and I decided, you know, we're making maple syrup anyway. We enjoy it. And we've decided that our proceeds would go to World Accord, which is where our passion lies. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that process. We'll walk through that and then we'll go look at our gardens and sort of and uh, our honeybees that we're, we're also doing as well. So I'll have Shannon maybe to sort of pick the camera up and we'll show you sort of how the process sort of starts. But uh, really the process starts when we when we tap our trees in. Usually it's mid-January into February where we start actually tapping the trees to, to draw the sap out of us. So just outside this building, and we don't need to walk there, but I'll show you where the hose comes in. Uh, so we have a line that actually comes in where we draw the sap into our evaporator. That comes into this particular little box we call a float box. And imagining it's just like the back end of your toilet, it will float up and down and control the fluid level, which is in this larger tank here. So we call that a flu uh, tank, where that actually works very much like a, a large radiator. So it allows the surface area to be increased through the sap and heat it and boil it a little bit quicker than just using a flat pan. And then we have our syrup pan at the front and we control that with another float box on the other side. And then finally, I got to treat myself to uh, 
a device called an automatic draw off where normally we would be watching the temperature really closely and, and doing it all by hand. Uh, last year we had implemented this little device. It has a thermo thermostat where it'll actually open and close a valve within a 16th or a 10th of a degree, I guess it is. Uh, open and close that and fill my milk jug and uh, we'll filter off of that uh, and start filling bottles from that with our bottling process. And I'll just get Shan to show you those devices. So from that milk jug, we'll, we'll come through here, we'll pump out of it. This is what we call a filter press. It runs through that. Um, and there's little filter papers that go inside that, which I, I haven't pulled any of them out. They're all sealed up tight uh, for the summer so we don't get any bugs and stuff in them. Uh, and then we pump that straight into this. And we call this our final finishing or bottling unit. It gets it up to us uh, about 200 degrees is where we uh, try to get that to. And it's a water bath so that it doesn't evaporate any further and make your syrup too thick. Uh, or otherwise it would start to turn into sugar or candy. And we draw that off into your bottles and we seal those up. So it's kind of our quick process. And we've, geez, I don't know how much we've got this year, maybe 1500 bottles somewhere in there uh, that we have bottled up and we will sell those uh, and donate that back to World Accord. And I think Dave's got it set up so that uh, you can purchase from us and, and Shan will have it as well. Uh, but I think the e-transfer account is maple syrup at worldaccord.org. And you can probably even email us to that particular one to put an order in as well, or, or certainly just send a message through this, this feed. Thank you. Over. I think it's actually just syrup at worldaccord.org, but thanks syrup. very much, Chad. Yeah, syrup at worldaccord.org. Hi, everyone. I guess it's my turn now. We're gonna going to head, uh, we're gonna go back and forth just because it's really hard to move around with an iPad. So Chad told you a little bit about the fact that we do a lot of our gardening here. And I want you first to understand that I am not an expert. Um, I My grandfather had a garden behind his home. My dad growing up, um, we had a garden. And uh, he always says, I didn't have much interest in the garden except for eating the food. So I've learned a little bit as we've gone along. Every year we've added um, a little bit to our gardening just to try and make it a bit more sustainable and more local. Obviously there are some things that you have to go to a grocery store, avocados, for instance, if that's something that you want. Um, but it's been a lot of fun. I find it relaxing. And I know that today, especially with everything that's going on, there's been a lot of interest in starting home gardens. And so I'm going to try and give some tips and show you what we've done. Right here, before we go over to the garden, Chad just thought we should stop and see the fruit trees. Um, some of them are in bloom. This peach tree has beautiful pink blooms and uh, the pear tree and the apple trees. Uh, so these, this is our little uh, nine tree orchard that we have. We have pears, um, cherries, and apricots, and just a lot of fun. Um, I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about them, but it, they're, they're fun to can and eat fresh and if you can get them before the birds do. So we're gonna head over to the garden now. And Chad's gonna try not to trip as we move. So we had mentioned earlier that uh, we're harvesting honey. Last year we actually started our first colony and they did not make it through the winter. Uh, so we're, we're just waiting on some new nukes coming, which is a, a nuclear family of bees to, uh, to be ready uh, to split from a guy up the road that uh, harvests queens. Um, but I'll show you just kind of what we have here. A couple of boxes. 
And from last year, there could be bees back in here. They're, they'll be coming in to, they'll be hunting. Oh, you can see inside. This is one of the uh, frames from last year. So I saved it uh, and it's gonna provide us with, uh, with honey if we choose to use that. But I've chosen to put it back in the box and let the bees sort of pick away at it and use the nutrients from it as they see fit. I don't need the honey yet. So that's kind of where we're at. So I, I thought there might be some bees on this particular one because it's nice and warm and sunny today. I thought they'd come flock all over it, but there's none today. Anything else you want to know about that? Uh, and then we talked a bit about our syrup. So here's our array of bottles that we have available. And the brand is the Reserve. Uh, we do have a website that's, it's been registered, but it's non-functional. Uh, so you'll be able to look for that. It's the Reserve maple.com um, but it's also available through uh, through the world accord site anything else you want to talk about that good all right so welcome to our garden i'll have chad sort of pan over it a little bit it has changed over the seven years that we've been here every year it grows just a little bit and so for those of you thinking about starting a garden you know, when I think back to when we started, um, we really wanted organic food. I love having fresh vegetables. And like I said, it, it is very relaxing, but it can also be stressful when you just don't know where to start. And so I guess my suggestion, if anyone's thinking about it, is start small and add a little bit each year. And so one of the things that we just started were sweet potatoes. And um, a lot of Pinterest hunting. So these are sweet potatoes. And I just, <laughs> my, my camera man is new at the job. <laughs> um, I did a lot of research and realized that it's actually quite easy to grow sweet potatoes. And each of these plants, in theory, is supposed to produce uh, eight to 10 sweet potatoes. So I literally went and bought a sweet potato from the grocery store and stuck it in a glass of water. After about two weeks, you start to see roots forming. And at the top, the sweet potato slips, as they're called, begin to grow. And so about three, four weeks ago, you dig your, I started doing this, you dig your nail underneath and pull the larger slips off. And I have two here ready to go. These ones are still too small. And then you put those into water. So these are ones that I had prepped and you'll start to notice that they also get tiny little root systems on them. And so these ones are ready to plant while these still need roots. So those ones I'll keep. And, and it's as simple then as poking a hole and starting your sweet potato vines. And they will start to look like vines. And what we purposely did with our sweet potato boxes is that we didn't attach them. So in the fall, when the sweet potatoes have grown, we have the ability to simply lift these boxes and the sweet potatoes should just fall out of the bottom. And then we can fill them up for the next year. So a really quick and easy way to grow about 50 to 100 sweet potatoes um, from the cost of one sweet potato in the store. Um, as we move down, I'm not gonna talk too much about uh, everything, but we do like to do a lot of canning. So um, it, it, when having a home garden, it's great for making your applesauce, canning your peaches. And this was a big one in our family, making salsa. My husband has terrible acid reflux and can't eat um, grocery store salsa, which was one of the reasons for the garden. 
So we started making our own homemade salsa and believe it or not, when we make it homemade, he can eat it without any problems. So it just goes to show you sometimes that making your own is just much better. So we make about we 72 jars of salsa a year. Um, yeah, it's zero calories, no <laughs> judging. As far as sustainable and homegrown, um, my husband was very frustrated when he saw that garlic, all the garlic in the grocery stores about three, four, five years ago came from China. And he kept saying, everyone tells me so, it's so easy to grow. Why can we not get any Canadian garlic? And uh, so he decided to find out how to grow garlic. And I have one left from last year. You can sort of see that it starts to sprout. And you would normally do this in the fall. So these were planted in October of last year and they begin to sprout and create a bulb. Really easy to grow garlic. Um, the one thing we did mess up the first year is that when they, the leaves start to go yellow, not like this, but when they really start to die down, that's about the time to pull them up and let them dry, the skin dry, and uh, they are ready to harvest. And then you simply break the cloves apart in October, some of them, put them in the ground and they're ready for next year. And so no longer do we have to have our garlic shipped every year from China. And we are just on our last bit of garlic. So last year we managed to grow enough garlic for us for the entire year. That and we, uh, I gave away probably a hundred little cloves that were sprouted to local neighbors in our community here. Uh, so you can, you can go into a nursery and buy tons of plants to get yourself started. But there are a lot of things that are going to uh, multiply on their own. The first year I bought four strawberry plants and I have not bought a strawberry plant since. Whenever they have the little runners, I nip them off, replant them. And you can see I have two beds of uh, strawberry plants now. Um, no matter where you are, <laughs> You have critters, so you'll notice that we have red squirrels here, and so we've had to create a contraption so that we're not feeding the red squirrels all the time. And so our strawberry boxes have chicken wire, makes it easy to get in and out of them, but it keeps the rodents out. And so what I'm saying is don't go out and buy 10, 15, 20 plants. Start with a few, they'll multiply. Something that loves to multiply, raspberries. Raspberries are continually growing smaller plants at the bottom. You can see them here. This one thing that you should know about raspberries is they will grow really tall and end up laying on the ground. And so creating some sort of a stand to keep them upright works really, really well. But they're also one of the easiest things to dig up and transplant. So this year, we expanded ours to a new one. So you'll see that it's just starting and I still have room at the end. Um, digging up all the small plants from this area over here. I'm just gonna start transplanting them and we will have raspberries into October, which is amazing. Um, however, I don't I generally get a ton of them because Chad spends every day going out and eating them right off of the plants. <laughs> Uh, one of our new additions this year as well, the cucumber trellis. I like to pickle cucumbers. Uh, and run up there. And these were just little bits of wood we had. It doesn't have to be expensive, but the idea is that all the cucumbers will then hang underneath and you can just go through and pick them off. I'm going to go back over here. It's kind of an exciting time in, in gardens when things start to pop up. One of the first things we see in March is generally the rhubarb, which always makes my family excited because that means rhubarb pie isn't very far away. And today our bean plants started to pop up. We're starting to see those. Um, something else I learned as I was gardening is to be patient and to learn that not all seeds come up at the same time. 
carrots and parsnips, which are over there, I won't see probably for another week and that's okay. My mom and dad are here gardening. We, this is actually a community garden. The behind me is their section. And uh, the next row is always makes me think about my dad. My husband loves Prince Edward Island and wanted to grow potatoes. And uh, we learned it wasn't very hard. My dad basically said, anybody can grow a potato. If you go and buy seed potatoes in the store, they're gonna be really, really expensive. So my suggestion is, just keep a bag of potatoes, a few of them in the bottom in a dark place until they start to grow eyes. And then it's as simple as making sure the eyes are up, covering them over. And from each potato, you should, uh, you should get a plant that will bear eight to 10 potatoes. So this is our row of potatoes. And if we go down a little bit further, you'll see some of the plants that are starting to come up. So these are all the beginnings of our potato plants. And when the plants start to turn yellow, beginning of August, then you simply get a shovel, start digging them up, and you're going to have tons of potatoes. We're gonna go around that way. Are we doing okay? About eight minutes. Eight minutes left. Okay. So, um, it's it's it is really expensive if you go into a nursery and have to buy all the plants. I'd start a lot of mine from seed mid March, and um, tomato plants are one of those things that always make me nervous because you have to start bringing them outside during the day and hardening them off. And when you've grown them inside, they tend to look a little bit sickly for the first couple of weeks when you plant them. Uh, this is a very, very good example right here, these ones here. If you look at the bottom, the leaves that were grown inside, they're kind of yellowy and, and wizeny. But the new sprouts that have come out since uh, we we've brought them outside are a darker green and that it's a thicker, darker part of the stem. And that's them getting used to being outside. So uh, don't worry. <laughs> I, again, I always thought that, oh, what am I doing wrong? A, a lot of gardening is just trial and error and learning how to grow things. Um, I, ha I have lots of things that go grow really well here and things that don't. Brussels sprouts, I try every year. One year they'll actually work. I have them planted, but they don't seem to like growing for me. Um, but you, you get to know your soil, you get to know your garden and you'll understand what works out well. With tomatoes, if it's something, because that's something we do grow a lot of for our salsa. One thing we did learn is you can't really grow them in bunches. You want them in nice long rows where they can get lots of air and water them from the base. Try to keep the, uh, the water off the leaves as much as possible and the water going straight soil. So something we use a lot are, is chicken manure. Um, it's great for fertilizing. And this year, every year we add something new to our garden space. Um, it, it's, it's good to do a little bit at a time. Don't overwhelm yourself if you're starting from scratch. This big open space here that Chad's gonna pan over doesn't look like much of anything right now. The hope is that it will have a chicken coop and a room to run around in. No, we are not going to harvest the chicken for laying hens um, just so we can have eggs. But this is going to become our chicken coop area. When we were in Guatemala, one of the things that we learned uh, is that chickens really need trees, they need shade. And so we thought there's some really nice trees and most of the day they're somewhere to get shade in. And it's really close to the garden. Um, we've seen a lot of plans where you can sort of uh, enclose the garden and let the chickens run in there as well. And so that's sort of the plan that we've come up with. We'll, maybe we'll do an update next year and we'll see how we did with chickens. <laughs> Hopefully better than with the Brussels sprouts. All right. 
If you're someone that loves to grow herbs, you'll notice that this is the shadier part of our garden. Herbs, lettuces, they grow really well in here. And uh, we go through a lot of dill and cilantro and chives. Um, so we'll move along along here. I know that a lot of people say, oh, there are things you can get right from the grocery store and stick in your garden. Here's proof of it. We had, we bought six romaine right into the garden and you can, they are, you can find a list on Pinterest of all of those things. And then of course our peppers and our jalapenos for our salsa. But this is the next area I wanted to talk about lettuce. So the back, lettuce. Something that's interesting about this and the reason it's in a box is so that I can cover it up later on. Um, they grow all through the year and if you get the right kind of lettuce, you can keep cutting it and it will keep growing all summer long. Same thing with kale. Kale will continue to grow even into January if you just cover it over with plastic. So it's one of those things that you could have fresh kale and I know kale is expensive. So in these times when our grocery bills are all going up, um, thanks to this uh, pandemic we have, it's a great way to have fresh kale. And the last thing in our garden I'm going to show you is our peas. Now these will have to be trellised later on, but lots of fun having fresh peas and getting the kids to shell them. So I, I guess, um, what I wanted to show everyone here, because I know there's so much interest, uh, nurseries have been saying they've been selling out of all different uh, seeds and vegetable plants, is it's, it's a great way to help uh, our grocery bills, for, especially for those of us that may have lost our jobs or not be working right now. It's a great time right now because we have time and just to try and don't get overwhelmed. Try a few things. Think about what you eat through the summer and it's local. It helps our environment. And it also shows us how much we need to appreciate those wonderful farmers that produce our food for us and all of our partners that work so hard to grow the food because a small garden like this can keep us really busy. And uh, those are the people feeding us. So that's what I want to say. Um, are there any questions? I don't know if I can't hear them. So <laughs> I haven't seen any questions. There's been lots of comments about uh, thanks for doing this and and that sort of thing, but I haven't seen uh, specific questions. Um, so I think I think we're probably fairly good in terms of you know what you're doing out there. Um, so I think we can, if, if anyone has a question, pop it onto the comment section quickly. In the meantime, I'll just uh, pop on for a sec and mm -hmm. talk a little bit about chocolate. Because, you know, when, when I was uh, inspired by Chad and Shannon and they're growing their uh, uh, maple syrup, well, they're not growing their maple syrup, mm -hmm. but they're making maple syrup and they're supporting World Accord with that as a social enterprise. And... Uh, uh, my wife, Sandy, likes chocolate, and one year I got her a book on how to make it, and then finally we got some equipment on how to make it. So we set up a bean-to-bar enterprise, and we make some, some chocolate from scratch, right? We grind up the beans. Well, first we have to roast them. Uh, we grind them up, and we have to winnow them. Uh, and then after they're winnowed, then we have to put them into a melanger that will grind them up. And, and we put them in there with, uh, with some milk solids and some organic cane sugar and some organic uh, cocoa butter. And we make a very good bean to bar, all organic, all natural, handmade with love chocolate. And it's called uh, the Caritas Chocolate Company. And we're not selling through any stores. We're kind of just making it through our home and we're selling it through our networks to our family and friends and our neighbors. And if anyone wants to set up something similar like that, that they want to do in their area, uh, we would be happy to, to help you with that as well. And we could, and if it's chocolate exactly that you'd like to do, we'd be happy to, uh, you know, help you set up with a little satellite shop in your area so that you could make Caritas chocolate as well. So uh, anyways, you could give me a shout at, at World Accord. My email is dbarth at worldaccord.org. And uh, I think I will let that go now. If you are interested in tiny houses, we have a person who's going to be sharing. Uh, Megan Gilbertson has been 
Oh, she's been going down to Honduras since she was 14 years old, and she's been going every year since. And she's 28 now, so she's been going for 14 years, building several places and, and always trying to live a little bit more sustainably. And Megan right now has got a, um, has got a tiny house that she has has built. They've designed and built this tiny house. And it's a way of sustainable living as well. And so we're going to be sharing, she's going to be sharing about uh, about their tiny house, about some of the design considerations and the construction. And that will be happening at 4.30. So come back on at 4.30. And always just keep your eye open for uh, Colleen Clarissa kind of popping on with other activities that she might have available for you to do. But uh, for now, I'd like to sign off and say thank you again for joining Dave, us. Dave. If you'd like to make a donation, by all Dave. means, there's a spot down below. Dave, yeah. there's, there's, there are three questions in the chat. Oh, so are there questions? The, yes. Okay, uh, where are they? Actually, there's four now. It's uh, under the comments, so I'll read them. Uh, the first question is, um, what kind of wood uh, do you use for the garden box? <sighs> are Chad and Shannon still on? They, they're just muted. Hi. Um, yes. Yeah, so the garden boxes, you want to make sure. Oh, unmute. You're, you're good. We're not muted. We're not muted. Can you hear yeah. me now? Okay. We can hear you. Um, good. So uh, the back of our boxes, we're sure not to use pressure wood because we didn't want uh any chemicals seeping in um so a lot of it is just raw wood which does mean they do need to be uh replaced quite often um however i do find that the boxes work for certain things for instance the blueberries require uh special ph garden soil so i have to add sulfur and other things to make sure that they're correct pH. So I don't use a lot of garden boxes, but when I do, make sure you're using wood that isn't pressure treated or doesn't have chemicals in it. Um, cedar is the best. Yeah, it seems to hold up a little bit better. We did use a lot of just plain spruce. So just your normal floor joists. Uh, so two by tens, two by eights are typically what we had purchased. Um, so the the couple things that I found online and I haven't been able to actually truly fact check it is that the new Sienna style pressure treated lumber is supposed to be safe to use. Uh, where the previous pressure treated, which is more of a green looking lumber, was not safe because of the copper arsenic they used to treat it, which stops the animals and things from actually eating it. Uh, so. I want to fact check that one 100%, but that's that was the research that I found on that. I uh, just built some uh, garden boxes for a friend. Actually, it was a social enterprise as well because I, uh, I built it for her for a donation for World Accord. And when she was pricing out those uh, the, uh, the garden friendly pressure treated wood, she found that it was just a small step up to cedar from there. You'd have to check in your area, but cedar works quite nicely as well and it'll withstand it. For myself, I just used uh, regular plain old two by fours. They're not treated, but they're very, very cheap. They will eventually rot and I'll have to replace them. So that's one of the things. What else do we have here? Someone said, what did you start the sweet potato in? What did I start the sweet potato in? Yeah, a glass. <laughs> a glass. Just water out of the tap and I sat the sweet potato in it. That and then you have to be patient. You have to keep filling it up. You can see that I need to put some more water in, but I was carrying it outside, so I didn't. You just keep filling up the water and keep it in a window where there's sunshine. And um, I start them about six, probably before they end up in the boxes. So again, end of, end of March is a good time to start, put your sweet potato in the water. Did you say you got about 50 plants off of that? Keeping in mind that our water um, yeah, somewhere in there. Keep in mind, our water is not treated. Yeah. Right. Well. So we're off a well. So the water, I'm not sure if the chlorine would have an effect on it uh, or if there's enough in it to really cause an issue, but something to be careful with. I have 25 plants so far, 
and there are a few more starting. So I think they would just continue to create plants, but each plant should produce about eight to 10 sweet potatoes. So awesome. with 20 plants, that's 200 sweet potatoes, but it's, it's also, it, it, it also, sorry. Well, I just said that's awesome. Um, it, it's also, it's also contained to the box space that you have. Some people have done them in bags. Um, some people do them in round containers. There's, there are tons of ideas on Pinterest. We just didn't want to spend a lot of money and we had this wood left over. So it made sense to do it this way for us. Yeah, we had Did taken you... a note from you, Dave, and we, we actually, all of the boxes are lined with straw wow. and the base. Uh, what I, my assumption was on that, and, and maybe you could agree with me or not, uh, was that the, I believe that there's enough nutrients that will actually draw the root system down towards that from the soil and allow the, the I think it's going to make your, you know, if you put carrots in as an example, I think it would allow them to grow longer rather than being stunted by clay or something that you might put it in. That's, uh, yeah. that's kind of why we did the mounds here at our place too, because we're pretty much on rock. Uh, so right. we, we built our rows up. Uh, It'd be more of a conventional looking potato farm actually with the rows the way they're built in wind rows uh, but it's because there's so much rock we just need to get a little more soil for the vegetables to grow in great great um have you tried sunflowers or other varieties of flower so we we didn't make it down to our flower field because the bees are actually in our lower field by the lower pond um we did cultivate into that soil, I don't know, 20 pounds of wild clover and flower seeds down there for the bees. Um, we are doing what the, the bee professionals are, are saying, don't cut your lawns, leave you know certain fields wild for the bees. And so that field that would generally get mowed is being left naturally. And we planted tons of wild flowers down there. It's our first time doing that. So maybe we'll post some pictures once the flowers come up, mostly clover. And I do have sunflower seeds that I'm going to put down there as well. Yeah, as a mixture, probably 50 different types of seeds. You know, your bee bombs and asters and, and such. Where do you we'll get them all from? Uh, USC or whatever the name of it is oh. now. The one that's attached to that home hardware in downtown Kitchener Waterloo. Oh, that's uh, that's Ontario Seed Company. Ontario Seed, yep. Yeah. Yeah, so it, we, you can purchase your stuff bulk in there. So that, you know, by the pound. Uh, okay. It, it wasn't cheap, <laughs> but <laughs> I think totally worthwhile at the end of the day because they're, uh, they're perennials. They will continue to come back up most of them every year. And seeds are becoming a little bit more expensive. So one of the things that we do try to do with tomatoes are really hard. I don't suggest starting there, but it's really easy to save bean seed, uh, to save seeds from a lot of the squashes, um, seed saving and drying them out and putting them in paper bags at the end of the season or wrapping them in newspaper is a great way to save money on seed the next year. And don't listen to those packages that say you have to use them within that year. Um, I have seeds as old as four years. Uh, yes, they want you to go and buy new seeds, but um, nothing against the seed manufacturers. But if you don't have the money and you didn't use all your seeds, go ahead and put them in the ground. I've, I've never had bad seeds. Very good. And uh, if anybody doesn't have a nice big piece of property like this, uh, you know, you can find all kinds of videos on YouTube for doing, you know, in small spaces. So you can you can have a small uh, garden in a small yard. You can have a garden that you do from buckets on your on your uh, balcony. There's all kinds of things you can do. Matter of fact, we have a bean plant right now that's just growing in Sandy's office. It's never been outdoors and it's got beans on it. So just a little bit of light and some water and that bean plant is, I mean, they're like magical fruit, right? <laughs> so. Yeah, it, it's all about experimenting and having fun with it. Um, yeah. It was harder for us to go up and we had the luxury of being able to spread out. And so that's what we did. But yeah, you have to look at your space and you have to look at what you're interested in growing and, and just have fun with it and let it be um, enjoyable. Excellent, excellent. Okay, well, I, I haven't seen any new comments, so I think we could maybe let you guys go. 
and uh, and we'll call this session to an end. And please, you know, keep keep if you have questions or comments or concerns, please put them in the comment box. Um, we'll continue to kind of monitor those, and whenever new comments come up, we'll try and make sure they get answered. Thank you very much, everyone, and uh, hope to see you at 4:30 for Megan Gilbertson talking about her tiny house. Okay. Thank you very much, and we'll sign off for now. Take care. Bye.